Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to talk about a couple of things. We've already mentioned a little bit about resistance, and we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail here. And we're going to go into the topic of electric power. And this will give us the last few things we need. And next time we will talk about electric circuits and how those work. So let's go ahead and get started here. And what we want to look at first is the concept of resistance. So resistance is the resistance to the flow of electricity. So some things have a very low resistance and those would be objects like metals. Other objects have a very high resistance and we call those insulators, things that do not easily allow electricity to flow. So things like rubbers and plastics generally resist the flow of electricity and serve as good insulators. Now the resistance of an object in this case we're looking at a cylindrical object which would be like a wire is proportional to two things it's proportional to its length and inversely proportional to its area. Now remember that if resistance is proportional to length that means the length increases then the resistance increases. And also resistance is inversely proportional to the area. That means one divided by the area. So if the area increases, now the resistance decreases. So we can see a little bit about how the variation goes here, how things change as you change the length or the area. So if you have a very long wire, the resistance is much larger. If you have a very thick wire, then the resistance is going to be lower. And the combination of those two will allow us to calculate the resistance. And the other thing that we need to know is the resistivity of the specific substance. So resistivity is given by the Greek letter rho and has units of ohm meters. So resistance here, the Greek letter omega for ohms and the meters. So now we can put these all together and find out that the resistance is equal to the resistivity times the length divided by the area. So we see that in our diagram here, the resistivity of this wire is given by, there's the resistivity depending on what it is made up of, how long is it, and what the area is. So longer, thinner wires will have a lot more resistance than a shorter, thicker wire. Now, and continuing on this topic, what we want to look at is what we know about these. So we have different types of objects. We talk about conductors already and insulators. So we can look at things that have a very small resistivity, allow things to flow. Things like copper that we use in wires has a very small resistivity and allows electricity to flow through it very well. An insulator has a very large resistivity and that means that it will not allow things to flow very well. And then we also have things like semiconductors which are in between and have a value intermediate here. So you can actually look at table 20.1 in the college physics textbook that we're using to be able to find values for resistivities if you're trying to calculate one of these. And let's go ahead and do an example calculation to get a better idea of this. So what we're looking at is that we have a, a car headlight filament. So the filament that lights up is made of tungsten and has a resistance of 0.350 ohms. The filament is a cylinder four centimeters long and we want to find out its radius. Now we do consider that this is generally a, a little bit of an approximation that things are not generally cylindrical that sometimes they are wound up into coils but we can at least use it as a idea to try to get, uh, get figure out this. So what we're trying to find is the radius of this. So as we usually do, let's put up what we know. The length is four centimeters or four times 10 to the negative two meters. The resistance is 0.350 ohms. And the resistivity we can get from our table as five times 10 to the negative eighth ohm meters. So that's everything that we know. 
And then we can use our equation for resistance to then calculate the air the area. So we know that the resistance is equal to the resistivity times the length divided by the area. And if we solve this for area, then we can figure out what the area is and that will allow us then to work and find the radius. So now that we have the equation that we're trying to solve for, we can then put in the values that we have. And we ha we know what the resistivity is. We know the length and we know the resistance. And we can then put that in to get the area. If we watch our units here, we can see that the resistances will cancel and we will get meters times meters, which is square meters, which is good for the area. Make sure we have our dimensions all set up right. And that's a good way to check that you rearrange the equation correctly is if your units do not come out right, then there's likely something wrong with the uh, with the work that you've done. So we can go ahead and calculate those and we will find that the area is 6.4 times 10 to the negative ninth square meters. So that's our area, but we're not done because we're not looking for the area. We're looking for the radius. Now the radius of a cylinder, we're looking at the cross sectional area. And that is a circle. And we know that that area is given by pi r squared. And that we can go back and calculate and rearrange this for r and find that r is equal to the square root of a divided by pi. So we've already determined the area. And we know what the value is for pi 3.14. So we can go ahead and put those values in to calculate and find that the radius is equal to the square root of 6.4 times 10 to the negative ninth square meters divided by pi. And we would find that that is 4.5 times 10 to the negative fifth meters or 0 0.045 millimeters. So it's a very, very thin wire, which allows the resistance to be high, which allows a lot of uh, uh, a lot of power to be put out and we'll see that in the next section because we have the very high resistance and a good amount of current going to be going through this to light the bulb that will allow the energy to come out as light that we can see using the headlight. So Ben worked one example here and the other thing that we want to look at here is talk a little bit about resistance and temperature. How does resistance vary with temperature? Because one of the things we didn't talk about is this when we talked about the resistivity. But resistivity also depends on temperature. So we can see that here for something like mercury that if the temperature is higher then the resistance is higher and the resistance decreases as the temperature decreases. So there is a temperature dependence as well. Although unless we are specifically asked about that in a problem, you would not need to worry about it. If you're given a resistivity, that's what you need to that's what you can use. Now what this leads to is the concept of superconductors because if you get those temperatures cold enough, we find that all of a sudden there is a drop in this case at about 4.2 Kelvin where the resistance goes to zero, meaning that there is essentially no resistance. And this is the idea of a superconductor. Zero resistance means that electricity can flow very easily without any resistance. So mercury does this as about 4.2 degrees. Now remember that's Kelvin. That is four degrees above absolute zero. So things have to be cooled to extremely low temperatures. But we do see this. It looks like things are dropping nice and uniformly here. And then all of a sudden at this temperature, the resistance stops and there is no resistance. So some objects that have a very high resistance at ordinary temperatures can become superconductors at these really low temperatures. And we want to start the other topic for this that we wanted to look at was power. So power is the rate of energy use. And for example, on light bulbs, the power is quoted in watts. So you talk about things like a 60 watt bulb and that it tells you the power that is being consumed when that light bulb runs. There are several ways to calculate this and I give you them here. They're all really the same. So the power is equal to the current times the voltage. Now remember that we also know from Ohm's law that the voltage is equal to current times 
resistance. So we can always use this to eliminate one of the things if we know the resistance. So sometimes you may know the resistance instead. So if you don't know the current, but you know the voltage and resistance, you can use this form to calculate the power. If you don't know the voltage, but are given the current and the resistance, you can use this form. And of course, you could always use Ohm's law to determine what you don't know. So if you need to determine the current, you could figure that out and use the first one. All of these are exactly the same, just rearranged and using Ohm's law. So let's go ahead and look at an example for calculating power. So we have an example here where we have an automobile headlight, which has a current of 2.5 amps when 12 volts is applied. And the cold resistance, so when it starts, is 3.5, remember, or 0.35 ohms. Remember that this does change and does have a temperature dependent, so it will increase as the temperature increases. So we are going to look for three things. We're looking for power when it's hot and when it's cold. And we are going to look for the current being drawn when it is cold. So what is the initial amount of current being drawn? We know when it's hot, once it's running, that it's a current of 2.5 amps. But how much current does it take to get it started? So let's go ahead and start and we'll look first at calculating the power when it is hot. So we know when this is running that it has a current of 2.5 amps and a voltage of 12 volts and that gives us 30 watts. That would be when the lamp is hot when it's running. However, it will be different when we look at it cold and when we look at it cold we have to use the resistance because this is the resistance when it is cold. So we're going to need that and now we need to use a different version of the equation. We don't know the current when it's cold, but the voltage is always 12 volts. So in this case, we want to use the version that shows power equals V squared voltage squared divided by resistance. So voltage is up here and the resistance is down here and that finds 411 watts cold. So the power when it gets started is much higher for the light bulb when you're just turning it on. It uses a lot more power than it does once it's actually up and running. So it takes a lot more power to get that started to warm it up and get it up to the temperature. And then as the resistance increases, the power will actually drop down. Now the last thing we wanted to calculate was the current. So we're going to have to use the other equation here which means power equals I squared times R. Remember, we do not know the current when it's cold. So we're looking for the current at the time when it's cold, which uses the resistance that we're given at cold and the power that we've just calculated. So this is the power when it starts. That goes in here. The resistance goes in here. And that will allow us to find the current. So we can put those values in and calculate it and find that the current needed as it starts is given by 34.3 amps. So we notice that it cuts down to 2.5 amps, but it takes a lot more current to get those ba that bulb actually lit up because the resistance is so much lower. Now, we'll ch as we change the current, the Resistance will then begin to increase as the temperature of it increases. Remember, higher temperature means higher resistance, lower temperature, generally lower resistance. And that will then drop the current down once it's running to the 2.5 amps that we were given. So we get to do one equation, one problem here that got you a chance to use all three versions of power at once. So we get to use all three of those power equations. Now the other thing that we want to look at and the last thing for this section is what we find is the uh, electricity cost. So what does it cost to run an electrical appliance? It depends on the amount of power consumed. So how much power are you using? And that cost is equal to the power times the time. And then the unit of energy that we use for uh, use on the uh, electric bill, if you look at your electric bill, it's kilowatt hours. So kilowatts times hours. And one kilowatt hour is 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules, 3.6 million joules for one kilowatt hour. And there, that means that there are two ways 
to reduce energy costs. If you want to increase decrease things, you can decrease the time that it's used, or you can improve the efficiency so that you're using less power. So one thing is that is like the CFL or LED bulbs that will in will decrease the amount of power that is used compared to an incandescent bulb and you'll also see them see, often see them compared that this uh, wattage of a 12 or 13 watt bulb is the equivalent of a 60 watt incandescent bulb. So you're cutting down the amount of usage. And the other way of course to do that is to not to run something as long turning things off will also reduce the time that you're using it which will also reduce energy costs. And we can go ahead and do an example of this to calculate how much energy is used. And this case we're given a cost of energy at 12 cents per kilowatt hour. We want to see how much it costs to use a 60 watt incandescent bulb for 1000 hours. If we replace it at a CFL, which is one quarter the wattage, what would be the cost? So in this case, we're going to compare what is the cost? Everything else remains the same. The cost of electricity is the same and the time is the same. The only thing we're changing is the wattage and we're going to compare those two. So let's go ahead and look at the incandescent bulb first. So the cost is 12 cents per kilowatt hour. The power is 60 watts and the time is 100 hours. So we can go ahead and start with this and we can do this with the power is 60 watts. The time is 1000 hours. So that would be 60,000 watt hours. And for comparison, we can then say that since that's 60,000 kilowatts, remember that kilo is 1,000. So 60,000 watt hours would be 60 kilowatt hours. So that is the amount of energy used. And then we need the cost, which is the amount of energy times the rate. Well, we know our rate is 12 cents per kilowatt hour here. We know how much energy we've used. We've used 60 kilowatt hours, meaning that the cost to run that incandescent bulb would be 60 kilowatt hours times 12 cents per kilowatt hour, which gives us $7.20. Now we can compare that with the CFL, which is one quarter of the wattage, and it's going to be one fourth the cost. Now you can go through the same calculation if you wish by putting this in as 15 watts and do the exact same calculation. But since we're only changing one thing, that's what's going to change. And we will find that then the cost of the CFL for a thousand hours is a dollar and 80 cents versus seven dollars and 20 cents for a standard incandescent bulb. Now the difference with this is that things like CFLs and LED bulbs are more efficient at putting out light that we can see. If you put your hand by one you will not fear, feel near the heat that you feel for a standard incandescent bulb. You will see how much hotter those are and that's because an incandescent bulb puts out a lot of energy in the infrared portion of the spectrum. So why is it not efficient? Well, we can't see a lot of the energy that it's putting out. So it does put out some it does work, but it's not very efficient for the kind of things that we were using it for. And in fact, that's why often an incandescent bulb is you can be used to cook things. And if if have things like the easy bake oven used to would use an incandescent bulb to heat up things and to do and to be able to cook small amounts of material. So it gets that hot that you could actually use a very high um, high wattage bulb as something as something like that. So the cost of the CFL is a lot less or the LED because they're putting out energy primarily putting out the energy in regions that we can see so they're not producing a lot of heat and infrared radiation that we can't see. So now that we've done a couple of examples, let's go ahead and finish up as we do with our summary. And what we find is the electrical resistance depends on three things. It depends on the length, the area, and the composition. And we, we looked at this for cylindrical. You could actually do things for others as well. For our purposes, we'd look primarily at something cylindrical uh, with the levels we have. And we have conductors, semiconductors, and insulators all have different levels of resistance. The highest resistance is an insulator, 
the lowest resistance is the conductor. And remember that if some objects, if you get them cool enough, you actually can get to a superconducting where the resistance essentially goes to zero. And then we looked at power as the rate of energy use. And that's measured, for example, on your electric bill as kilowatt hours. So we can go ahead and use that. And we did an example to compare the energy use of a light bulb over a thousand hours. So that concludes this lecture on resistance and electric power. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day, everyone. And I will see you in class.